for this lecture, we'll be talking about a slightly more advanced topic about uh, long distance physics in ADS, uh, the light cone limit of the bootstrap equation, the large spin expansion, and various applications uh, that this has. So just to start off with a picture, <coughs> In ADS, we saw that for any object whatsoever, if we talk about its center of mass coordinate, then there are certain uh, <coughs> geodesics that classical particles follow, and then there are certain uh, corresponding quantum states that a quantum particle can follow that correspond to some orbit uh, around the center of ADS, where the object just <coughs> keeps going and going and going with some uh, with some orbital angular momentum uh, L. And all of these orbits have the same period. And they're all perfectly good geodesic motions. There's no, there's no central force operating to keep uh, such an object on this trajectory. It just follows this trajectory as a free particle in anti desitter space. So these trajectories have a nice feature that actually isn't available for flat space physics which is that they let us to talk about distances in a very convenient way. In particular, I can imagine a setup where I have uh, some particle or any kind of object whatsoever. It doesn't have to be an elementary particle. It could be a cat, it could be a galaxy, uh, whatever, that's sitting at the center of ADS. So I have sort of like uh, a cat here. and. Uh, and I have a dog, uh, the, both of them are, are, are in spacesuits, uh, orbiting around the cat at some angular momentum L. And since these two objects just follow these trajectories in the absence of <coughs> forces between them, um, I can talk about the separation between these two objects, some geodesic separation kappa. <coughs> and I can tune that distance kappa just as a function, just by changing what the angular momentum is. So there are many, many ways of seeing what the relationship is. So kappa is the geodesic separation. And L is the angular momentum. What is the relationship between kappa and L? Well, roughly speaking, kappa is of order log L over delta where delta is, say, like delta cat or delta cat plus dog, something like that. I'm imagining they have roughly the same delta. Um, so how do you see this, uh, this dependence? Well, there are many ways of, uh, of seeing this relation. One of them is that we notice that the, the wave functions, psi and L, um, were proportional to cosine to the delta rho, sine to the L rho. And then there was some hypergeometric function. But if I set n equals 0, which means that I actually have a circular orbit, then uh, this hypergeometric function is just 1. You can look it up and, or you can just believe me. So it's easy to figure out what the relationship is between the maximum of this wave function and uh, L. I can just look for the maximum of this product. So uh, d rho of psi is 0. And that tells me that tangent of rho is L over delta, which in turn tells me that uh, this is also equal to cinch of kappa. And so for very large L, cinch of kappa is basically e to the kappa. <clears throat> this was something we derived in the first lecture via some change of coordinates. So cinch kappa is basically e to the kappa. So you see that, uh, uh, that this relation this so relation holds for our orbiting dog in a spacesuit. So this is some relation for two free objects in anti-de-sitter space. It tells us, it gives us a way of, of talking about their separation in terms of angular momentum. So this allows us to ask the question, well, what are the, what are the corrections to free propagation? What are the forces between these two objects? So, in, uh, also in the first lecture, we saw that if we have, say, some gauge force or gravitational force, something that obeys Gauss's law, we learn that the potential uh, V of kappa 
was very, very small at some constant times e to the minus d minus 2 kappa. Translating that using this formula, this tells us that this is basically 1 over L to the d minus 2. So long range forces that fall off exponentially with geodesic separation correspond to potential energies between these objects that fall off as some power law in angular momentum um, with, some, uh, with some power that depends on the mass of the particle that's creating the force. So this is the correct exponent for a massless uh, gauge boson in the bulk or a massless graviton in the bulk. Um, we would just get other different powers for other kinds of interactions. So one kind of question that we can ask is, are these features really a special aspect of anti-de-sitter space when we have sort of weakly interacting cats and dogs? Or is this kind of behavior a universal feature of conformal field theories? And it turns out that, that the latter is true. For large L and large kappa, um, this is really a property of every CFT in three or more dimensions and kind of all reasonably holographic CFTs in d equals two dimensions. So I want to talk about how we, we would prove that. Um, this goes a long way to sort of explaining how locality emerges in ADS CFT. So when we talk about locality in ADS CFT, since ADS has an intrinsic length scale, the ADS radius, there's sort of two different regimes we can discuss. We can discuss the regime of whether or not physical, physics is local on scales much bigger than this ADS curvature, which is the regime that we're obviously studying here. Um, and we can also talk about locality, sort of micro-locality, locality in the regime where ADS curvature doesn't really matter much and you're effectively studying flat space physics. Um, this is something that, that has a, a long, illustrious history of being studied and understood better and better using the bootstrap. And surprisingly, it turns out that the kind of thinking that, uh, that produces this analysis that makes a lot of sense at large spin also has implications for, somewhat rem very remarkably, for the short distance regime where I don't have this beautiful picture of, uh, of cats and dogs orbiting each other very, very well at very, very large distance, but instead really kappa's, uh, kappa's small. So that's a surprising feature that just emerged in, in the last year. Um, and hopefully by the, the end of the lecture, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how that happens. So now we're going to actually use the, uh, the bootstrap equation to try to understand why this might be true in general. And just to remind you, since energies in ADS correspond to dimensions of operators in the CFT, in this situation where we have a cat uh, at the origin and a dog orbiting, um, we would expect the energy in total to be delta cat plus delta dog plus uh, we set the little n value for the dog to be 0, um, but we get an, a big energy corresponding to the angular momentum. And then this is just this is just the free propagation part. Then we would expect that there could be some anomalous dimension piece. And this anomalous dimension piece is what these interaction energies are giving us. So interaction potentials in ADS translate into anomalous dimensions in the CFT. So what we'd like to ask is, do we have any control over the existence of these states? and the behavior of this anomalous dimension. And that's, that's what we're going to see. So the very zeroth order thing, though, is to establish the existence of the states. Naively, if I just tell you I have a quantum mechanical system, and I have a state in that system corresponding to a cat, and a state in that system corresponding to a dog, it's not obvious that there's a state corresponding, that there's even a state in the Hilbert space corresponding to a cat here and a dog very far away. So that's the first thing that we'll establish. And then we'll be able to understand the behavior of these anomalous dimensions. <clears throat>
And for me, you can be motivated to do this for many reasons. For me, one of the big motivations is understanding whether CFTs always have this kind of ADS interpretation for their states. So any questions about the setup? Great. <clears throat> so how do you prove some, that, that these states exist and that they have some particular anomalous dimension? Well, there's a very simple analogy uh, just to scattering processes. So the cat and the dog in this picture are just freely propagating. So what happens if we study free propagation and corrections to it in flat space? So if I have, uh, if I have some two to two scattering amplitude and I exchange a massless state in the T channel, it could be a gauge boson or graviton or scalar or whatever, um, then I expect that the scattering amplitude will be something like one over T, which in angular variables is like one over S times one minus cos theta, where theta is the scattering, am uh, scattering angle. I think of these from another point of view as incoming and outgoing, and there's some scattering angle theta. So <clears throat> the fact that there's a singularity in the T channel says that there's a singularity as cosine theta goes to one. Now, there's a kind of completely trivial bootstrap equation for this here. This t-channel singularity, uh, uh, this presentation using this t-channel singularity kind of makes physics propagating in this direction uh, evident. But of course, we're interested in physics propagating forward in time. And thus, we can rewrite this as some sum of partial waves in the s-channel. where P sub L or Legendre polynomials, whatever, they're polynomials in uh, cosine theta of degree L. So naively, this equation looks like it's, it, it couldn't possibly be satisfied. <clears throat> if you're extremely naive, if this was a finite sum, this equation couldn't possibly be satisfied. Because as cosine theta goes to 1, this, this side of the equation has a singularity due to t equals 0. Whereas these are all polynomials, and so some sum of polynomials, a finite sum of polynomials, will never uh, give me a singularity. So of course, the resolution to this is that an infinite number of L's contributes. We have to sum L all the way to infinity. The C sub L's are non-trivial all the way out to infinity. And in particular, by studying the behavior around cosine theta equals 1, by extracting this singularity, we can learn about what the asymptotic behavior of C sub L is, right? I mean, if, uh, <clears throat> if we really write this in terms of, for example, uh, some coefficients where this is just cosine the L theta, then we have to have some large L behavior, some specific power law in A sub L. <clears throat> in particular, these have to be uh, uh, approaching order one in order for this infinite sum to match the singularity structure. So we get control over the large spin expansion in the S channel by <coughs> learning how to reproduce the singularities of an on-shell particle in the T channel. And in particular, you can say that this is a sort of light cone limit in the sense that the singularity comes about when our exchanged particle has uh, some null or light-like momentum. So yeah. Example, yeah, I think it just AL goes to 1 over L. Yeah. 1 over L? So, so, well, sorry, uh, 1 over S. Yeah, this is just, this is just, this, I mean, you can just expand this and it just cosine to the L. Yeah. That's just that. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the idea. Um, and so the question is can we set up a similar bootstrap equation? Uh, analogous to this in order to learn about the CFT. So that's the idea. Good. So usually, uh, 
we often study CFT four point functions in this configuration. And if we impose that we're really in the Euclidean region, then we need z to be equal to z bar dagger. So we can take a Euclidean OPE as z goes to 0, but that also forces z bar to go to 0. And you can study that process. Probably Miguel explained that this tells you something about the convergence of the OPE expansion in the cross channel. So if I take uh, z and z bar both to 0 in this way, then I'm expanding <coughs> in the singular term here. And that tells me something about the convergence of the conformal blocks in the cross channel where I expand a z in, in the limit that z goes to 1. So this tells us about uh, OPE convergence. Now, whenever we violate this condition, z equals z bar dagger, um, we're leaving the strict Euclidean region and starting to approach some Lorenzian separation. So the idea of the light cone OPE limit is that we can send z bar to 0, but with fixed fixed z. Now, you might worry that this, that this, this studying this limit violates OP convergence, but, uh, but our conformal block decomposition will still converge as long as we don't cross branch cuts. So <clears throat> the convergence of the control lock decomposition will be somewhat delicate. That's intentional because we want to do something like approaching some singularity. But <clears throat> as long as we don't cross any branch cuts, the control lock decomposition will still converge. And we win because <clears throat> instead of just having a single, instead of taking both of our parameters z and z bar to 0, we now have an, ex an entire function's worth of constraints. So we send z bar to 0, but now <clears throat> we, can, we can study the bootstrap in that limit for any z, and we can learn a lot about what the solutions uh, to crossing look like. So <clears throat> let's just look at the example. So uh, <clears throat> one can do this analysis in z and z bar. Um, I'll <clears throat> I'm going to use, basically for historical reasons, these other variables, uh, u and v. But one can switch back and forth between them. So <clears throat> what, is the, what is the simplest example? Well, if I study a generalized free theory, which is supposed to be equivalent to just a free theory in ADS, We wrote down the four-point function and it just takes this form. So now what we want to ask is, how is this four-point function reproduced by a conformal block decomposition? So <clears throat> if we expand in, so we're, we're going to be taking the limit u goes to 0 and v fixed. So you can see that as z bar goes to 0, u goes to 0. Uh, this just becomes 1 minus c. 
So if we expand in the limit where uh, <coughs> zz bar go to 0 or u goes to 0, we get a term just from the identity operator in this channel for the fact that these two operators have, uh, have the identity in their OP plus, sorry, maybe I wanted to do the other. Well, I'll just do this. Um, So <clears throat> clearly, we match u to the minus delta with u to the minus delta. But the question is, from this point of view, how do we match the singularity as uh, v goes to 0? So here, there's this extra singularity uh, in the cross channel. Sorry. Ah, good. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, I mean, I'm going to. Those are just some um, overall factor <clears throat> and I mean from now on I'm just going to cancel these out um, equivalently you can uh, uh, I mean when you when you, when you when you go to this coordinate system and you <clears throat> take this operator to infinity these, uh, these and rescale these go away So the question we want to ask is, how, uh, how do these terms, in general, where you just have a sum of some deltas and Ls, how do these terms behave um, in this limit that uh, v goes to 0? And these go like some power series, uh, f naught of u plus uh, v f1 of u plus dot, 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 plus log of v times naught of u plus dot, dot, dot. And so the point is that the individual terms in this conformal block decomposition as v goes to 0 only behave as log of v. Those are the most singular terms in each of these conformal blocks. And so the only way we can reproduce this singularity as v goes to 0, so I switched. I apologize. <clears throat> The only way we can reproduce this singularity as v goes to 0 is from an infinite sum over these uh, conformal blocks. So th there is this singularity as v goes to 0. These conformal blocks, uh, as v goes to 0, just behave like a constant or log v plus a series expansion in v. So no finite number of them. Uh, can reproduce the singularity. I no, I I I I did an awkward switch in my notes, um, so uh, uh, I apologize. Um, so maybe I should. I mean, let's see. I can I can fix this in. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Let's, let's keep, all right, let's unswitch. So this is u goes to 0 with v fixed. These factors are the thing that I wrote incorrectly. So this is v to the minus delta, v to the minus delta, 
Um, this is a conformal block of VU. And then we're taking U goes to zero. So I apologize. This is V to the minus delta V U. This is if U U. Okay, so this is this is I apologize. <coughs> It's just a question of which channel we choose in the bootstrap equation. We want to choose u goes to zero v fixed. That means we want to expand uh, in the u channel on this side, which means we want to expand in the channel where v goes to zero in, in the other side. Here we cancel automatically this singularity, but now the u goes to zero singularity is not reproduced by any finite number of terms here because these behave like log of u as u goes to zero for any specific finite set of conformal blocks. And <clears throat> this is some series expansion these have <clears throat> in the u, u goes to zero limit. There's some constant term that depends on v. And then there's a log u term times some other functions of v. So that's <clears throat> the reason why we need an infinite number of conformal blocks. So <clears throat> what's a better approximation for these conformal blocks so that we can try to understand what infinite sum actually reproduces uh, this side. Well, it turns out that uh, in general, <clears throat> I'll introduce notation. So we write the twist tau as delta minus L. So how does one of these conformal blocks, uh, g delta L, behave uh, at small u? <clears throat> so <clears throat> the limit we need to consider is the limit as L goes to infinity, because we need to sum an infinite number of conformal blocks um, with u small. Now, how do these conformal blocks behave? So the conformal blocks <clears throat> are proportional to this Bessel function, which very roughly you can think of as giving 2 to the tau plus 2L minus 1, um, V to the tau over 2, E to the minus 2L root U over the fourth root of u. So <clears throat> this approximation isn't going to be quite good enough for us, but it has the two key features that I want to display. It's actually going to be good enough to get the, uh, <clears throat> the asymptotic matching of the singularity. It's just not quite good enough for the coefficient. So <clears throat> I don't have a lot of intuition about how Bessel functions necessarily behave, but I have a lot of intuition about exponentials. So <clears throat> Let's look at how, uh, how we might match this term from this infinite sum. So we're imagining we're taking a limit as u goes to 0, and we're trying to reproduce the right-hand side. <clears throat> well, we have this factor of v to the tau over 2, and we have this prefactor of v to the minus delta, delta o. So we're trying to match a term which is completely independent of v as a function as u goes to 0. So that suggests that 
this tau should be approaching 2 delta O. In other words, it seems like if I study some sum of operators uh, contributing to this conformal block with a tau different from 2 delta O, I'm going to get a v-dependent function on the right-hand side, but I have no v-dependence whatsoever on the left-hand side. So that would be a problem. <clears throat> Further, this tells me something about what has to happen at large, large L. So I'm going to do a sum at large L in order to recover the, the u-dependence, this u-dependent singularity, u to the minus delta O. Well, if I have, <clears throat> if I perform a sum over L at large L, this exponential, then <clears throat> note that uh, for small root u but bigger than 0, <clears throat> I am free to multiply by some power law in L. <clears throat> And I'll still get convergence at large L because I'll get some, small, some exponential suppression. But I don't have, there's no convergence for root u less than 0. So this is this sort of delicacy of this light cone limit. I can't cross uh, the branch cut <coughs> as u goes to 0. But as long as I study small positive u, um, I can, I, I'm free to perform this sum. So the idea is, um, how, do the, how should these conformal block coefficients behave in order to reproduce uh, the left-hand side? If we have conformal block coefficients associated with twist 2 delta O and angular momentum L such that I, so this is, this is a squiggly. I'm not going to keep track of the numerical prefactor. <clears throat> if I have a 2 to the minus 2L in my uh, conformal block coefficients to cancel this 2 to the 2L in just the definition of the conformal block, and then I have a factor of L to some power, which it turns out has to be uh, 2 delta O minus 3 halves, then I can see that something nice happens when I perform this sum. So I'm going to have a sum of these P times And this is a sum out to L equals infinity. Um, I'll get in squiggly v to the delta O as a prefactor. Uh, the factors of 2 cancel. And I get a sum of L to the 2 to O minus 3 halves e to the minus 2L root u over root of u. And now, since I'm summing all the way to infinity, I can replace the sum with an integral and I have L to a power e to the minus So this is really sort of the punchline where you can see why uh, a specific power law behavior for these conformal block coefficients is associated with uh, this singularity as u goes to 0, because this is just some simple Legendre transform. We can just rescale this integral and pull out a factor of 
we can rescale L to uh, And we can see that this entire integral scales as u to the minus delta o. So this v to the delta o just cancels this in this sum. And we reproduce the light cone OP singularity as u goes to 0 on the left-hand side. So the idea here is just that you have to know some complicated slightly annoying facts about the behavior of conformal blocks in this uh, light cone OP limit. But roughly speaking, at a, at a sort of qualitative level that's sufficient to get the scaling, but that just doesn't get the numerical prefactor, we have something like e to the minus L root u, a sum of a power law times this factor <coughs> can just be rescaled as L goes to infinity. And that's what gives us this uh, light cone OP singularity. So what this says is that we have to have this infinite tower of operators, or at least we have to have their accumulated contribution at large spin in order to reproduce the uh, light cone OP limit singularity. Yeah. Uh, this, this, this power of L, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, for the anomalous dimension, it was the gravitational interaction. Right? Yeah, so, so this is free propagation. This is just free propagation. So this is, this is an asymptotic formula uh, for the OPE coefficient of O of X, O of Y, with uh, double traces O to the, so, uh, I think roughly speaking, this is something like I study the free four-point function, and then I uh, take the OPE of these things to extract this, this three-point function. And uh, presumably, I have powers of two delta in the denominator, I mean, when I, uh, in this, in this four-point function. And then I differentiate L times. And uh, presumably, that's this, this kind of behavior is what I get. But I don't, I don't know of a, a nice physical way of telling you why the OP coefficient takes this form. Another question. So, yeah. So you had an approximation for the Bessel function at large arguments, right? Yes. So I do not understand so, why wasn't this figure enough? What was the mathematical reason why this is not good? Good. So uh, the reason is, the, the reason why this isn't good enough, but this is, is that really what you want is uh, L goes to infinity with L root u fixed. As, as you take u to 0, so you can ask what operators are actually contributing to this at finite but very, very small u. And th the right-hand side is dominated by operators with L of order uh, 1 over u squared. So in other words, you have to, you have to take this limit with L root u fixed. Um, if you then take this argument to be large, this is a good approximation. But this actually gets contributions from L root u order 1. So this, get, this, this gets the scaling right, but it doesn't get the prefactor right. OK, so any, any more questions? Um, the basic conceptual idea is that we're trying to reproduce the singularity, and we do some uh, math to figure out what the conformal blocks behave as, and then we learn what the large L coefficients have to be, and this is what they have to be. By themselves, these coefficients aren't that interesting. What's more interesting is the corrections to this. So this is just free propagation. Now, when I wrote down this equation, I just wrote the correlation function for a generalized free theory. But what if I study a general conformal field theory and not just a GFT? Does this kind of analysis still hold? And the answer is yes for a large class of theories if I just replace this with any CFT, I want to ask, what is the u goes to 0 limit of the correlation functions in any CFT? Well, there will be some next correction to this as u goes to 0. 
the first correction to it will be of the form u to the tau minimum over 2 minus delta O. times some times some function of v that I'll write down in a second, and with some factor here. So what, what is the picture for what we're doing? We have, uh, where should I erase? Just over here. We have a bootstrap equation of this form. So in this channel, we can have the identity contribute. And then the next contribution in the light that dominates in the light cone OPE limit will be uh, some minimal twist operator. So that operator might be the stress energy tensor or some conserved current. It could also be just some scalar operator phi. But It'll be whatever operator in this channel has the smallest twist. And we're matching that to some sum of what turns out to be contributions of double trace operators, operators with tau equals 2 delta O and L goes to infinity in the cross channel. So the dominant contribution. Um, in this OPE limit, u goes to 0, is from the identity. It's the most singular part. But then we'll get other contributions from other operators of small twist. So they'll have some <coughs> OPE coefficient squared lambda. And then this will be the dependence on u. And then we'll get some general function of v. And <coughs> to avoid uh, to avoid belaboring this any further, all I want to say about f is that f of v has terms that are like a constant, and it also has terms that look like log of v. And this is really what I want to turn my attention to. So how can we match log of v How can we match a term here looks like a plus b? log of v in uh, this channel. <clears throat> and the answer is, since um, <clears throat> in our sum we had a factor of v to the tau over 2, <clears throat> in fact, we can put this back in our sum. At zeroth order, I said that tau is just 2 delta O in order to uh, cancel this factor. But in fact, there's some correction. So the twist tau is actually delta O plus some small correction. So <clears throat> this zeroth order piece is just the free, the free propagation, the energy of these objects freely propagating in ADS. This correction is the binding energy. <clears throat> and the reason why this can reproduce the log is that v to the tau over 2 is approximately to O times 1 plus gamma of L log v. And so by matching the contribution of gamma of L, So we get a sum of uh, <clears throat> by matching this correction to this logarithm in the cross channel, we learn 
what the dominant behavior of gamma of L is. <clears throat> and since it's associated with uh, a reduced singularity, we learn that gamma of L has to go like lambda, that OPE coefficient, times some numbers over L to the tau min. So <clears throat> that's how we learn about these binding energies in ADS from these subleading corrections to the bootstrap equation. And in particular, uh, tau min for t mu nu or j mu equals d minus 2. The stress energy tensor has dimension d and spin 2, so it has twist d minus 2. And so we recover this long distance gravity formula in ADS. Now, what about the coefficient lambda? Well, the coefficient of lambda, say we have t mu nu being exchanged, comes from the product of O O t mu nu, which is proportional to uh, uh, delta of O. And we also get, we also need to include the normalization of t mu nu, which gives us a factor of root ct. And thus, we recover that this, this formula, in this formula, lambda is proportional to delta O squared over CT, which is like the mass squared of O times G Newton in ADS. So you learn about the universal long distance behavior of gravity and other forces uh, through this analysis. So any questions about uh, this bootstrap matching? Yeah. yeah. This whole thing is dependent on the fact that you have infinitely many operators, right? So you can't just have, like, if you choose some like, minimal model thing where you have like two or three or four or something operators, this completely changes up and down, right? Good. So what is the caveat about this whole analysis? We need uh, tau min to be bigger than 0 in order to have any separation between this term and that term. So if this term is clearly separated from everything else, this is the most singular thing. And we just have these uh, generalized free theory double trace or double twist type operators at large spin. But if there's no separation on this side, then all this analysis goes to hell. Now, the thing that's nice is that if we're in a CFT in three or more dimensions, there's a unitarity bound that says that tau always has to be positive. And so this is always true in 3D and higher theories, such as even the 3D icing model. Um, in 2D, it's more complicated because there can be conserved currents, like the stress, like the stress energy tensor and the, the Virasoro identity block, that have tau equals zero, and then you have to include all of those. Any other? So this type of analysis has found many applications. I'm biased towards the ADS interpretation, but there are lots of other situations uh, where you can learn something. Um, so you can do this same kind of analysis, <clears throat> not just at large spin uh, <clears throat> and fixed twist, but large twist and large spin if you assume that there's some other perturbative parameter, like a 1 over n expansion. And so people have used this to study scattering in ADS at uh, not just at large separation, but fixed energy, but, uh, but general scattering. Um, in a weakly coupled CFT, you can run into a situation where there's an infinite tower of operators that contribute here. So it might be that they're separated from uh, the identity. So this is the identity, and this is, for example, conserved currents. But you might have an infinite tower of conserved currents. And you can study this approximation in that limit um, and recover a lot of sort of 
properties of weakly coupled CFTs in a completely universal way. Um, <clears throat> but perhaps uh, uh, more interestingly, you can use this you can use this approach in combination with causality to derive various general constraints on conformal field theories. There are uh, uh, conformal collider constraints on the central charges of 4D CFTs. You can uh, use this type of analysis uh, to, <coughs> to identify those bounds. Um, you can also use this type of analysis to understand uh, constraints on the, uh, the existence of just Einstein gravity in ADS. So you might ask, in ADS, why do you have Einstein gravity and not some, uh, <clears throat> some theory of gravity with lots of higher derivative corrections? Um, <clears throat> you can use these constraints, along with some other assumptions about the CFT, in order to prove that in certain, in certain cases, you just have to have Einstein gravity. Um, so let's see, I don't know how much. How much time do I have left? OK. So for the last 15 minutes, I want to tell you about something uh, uh, more powerful about this analysis that, uh, uh, that's come to light recently, which is that this perturbation expansion at large spin is really much better to behave than you might have guessed. So from this analysis that I, I told you about, all we really know is that at large spin, um, there have to be some operators with that contribute with these OP coefficients. But we don't know their density. We don't know that there's an operator for every L. Um, we don't know exactly what this, whether their OP coefficients are chaotic and complicated, but somehow add up to give these results. All we really know about is the sort of asymptotic behavior. And so you might think that this perturbative expansion at large spin isn't so well defined. But it turns out that uh, in, in a very nice paper, Simone Karen quote showed that, in fact, there's a way of extracting OP coefficients from CFTs that gives you an analytic formula in spin. So let me first tell you about the idea of this. So why So the idea is, let's just study a, a toy example. Let's say we have some function of energy which just has some power series expansion around E equals 0. E is just some variable. Now, in many cases, uh, uh, so we can extract these coefficients via a contour integral of this form. Now, when I, write down, when I write this formula down as a contour integral, you're already thinking that we're doing complex analysis. But what I actually want you to think is that this isn't complex analysis. This is more like real analysis. Why? Well, <clears throat> instead of writing this in a fancy form, I can write this equivalently <clears throat> as an integral from 0 to 2 pi of some angular coordinate where I think of e as some epsilon e to the i phi. And now, <clears throat> now what I'm really doing is decomposing my function into some Fourier series on the integral on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And these functions are a basis of all functions on that interval. And I'm using an inner product to project out these Cs. That's really what I'm doing in this sort of tiny neighborhood around E equals 0 uh, in the complex plane. And so if I'm taking an inner product with a basis, then I really have to use the basis. I can't, I can't analytically continue in L here, because really, the basis only makes any sense 
when L is an integer. So this is, this is very, very trivial stuff about, uh, uh, about inner products. But now I want to contrast that with the power that I get by making assumptions about the behavior of F in the complex plane. So if I take, if I assume that F of E over E goes to zero as E goes to infinity, and even, even more strongly that the only singularities of F are some set of branch cuts. Branch cuts on uh, E between 1 and infinity. So in other words, if I assume that F can have a branch cut from 1 to infinity and minus 1 to infinity, but otherwise it has no singularities at all, then I'm making some extremely strong assumption about these coefficients, which is very hard to describe except in this language. But somehow these coefficients are all linked together in a way that leads to these analyticity properties. And if I can make these assumptions, then I can, of course, analytically continue the contour integral I first wrote down and give it a different form as an integral along the branch cuts. So I had some integral along some singularity I inserted here. I can turn it into some contour integrals along the branch cut and rewrite my formula as an integral from 1 to infinity dE of f of e plus Ah, uh, sorry. I get some new form for uh, my contour integral that now is over e from 1 to infinity and minus 1 to infinity. Or I can collect them together in this way. And now, now I can suddenly analytically continue So in this case, it wasn't obvious. And in fact, it didn't make any sense to analytically continue in spin, this index L that I'm calling spin, <clears throat> because this contour integral stops making sense whenever L isn't an integer, just like this inner product doesn't make any sense if I analytically continue the basis. But if I know something about the analytic structure of the function, then suddenly I get some analytic behavior in spin. So <clears throat> this process is very simple for a function like this. The idea of what uh, Simon Karen Quote did <clears throat> is he, and with, with other people, I think also with Joao, found uh, a kind of inner product formula that when you hand it, hand this inner product formula a CFT correlator, it takes an inner product with conformal blocks and uh, spits out the OP coefficient associated with some very specific conformal block. Now, that formula, I mean, I think it itself is interesting. But then what he was able to accomplish is to analytically continue his, uh, the, the integrals in the, involved in this inner product um, to Lorenzian signature, where <clears throat> it was possible to demonstrate that after that analytic continuation, which was valid because of uh, the good behavior of various OPE limits, the, uh, this formula for extracting OPE coefficients became entirely analytic in spin. So I can tell you very briefly uh, what this formula looks like. 
So there's some formula There's a measure factor. There's a conformal block <clears throat> with some weird delta and L. And there's some object called the double discontinuity of of the CFT correlator. So what is this double discontinuity? Um, well, you can define a kind of amplitude for the CFT, which is the correlator uh, after analytic continuation. <clears throat> and then the double discontinuity is the imaginary part of M. But what does this mean if you're a, a practical person? So Sure. So if we think of computing some CFT correlator with some operator at the origin, one and out at infinity. <clears throat> Then <clears throat> there's some four point correlator that takes this form. <clears throat> there are two ways that we can, there are two different ways that we can access the Lorenzian region. Um, <clears throat> one is that we can analytically continue, so we can take Z fixed and send z bar through this branch cut and back. Or we can send z bar around the branch cut the other way. And this double discontinuity is just the, is just Euclidean correlator minus 1 half times the sum of the correlator after one analytic continuation plus the correlator after the other analytic continuation. <clears throat> so there exists this nice formula for projecting out these OP coefficients. And <clears throat> after this analytic continuation, to compute this double discontinuity, we have some function that's completely analytic in spin. So that means that the large spin expansion that seemed like it was just some asymptotic expansion for these OP coefficients actually produces an analytic function uh, that I can take all the way down to spin 2. So this is <clears throat> So in other words, these asymptotic formulas I wrote down for the behavior of OP coefficients and operator dimensions um, at asymptotically large spin don't just make sense at asymptotically large spin, but in principle, they can be continued. The perturbation theory in spin makes sense all the way down to 1 over L of order 1 half, roughly speaking. This also tells you that since these are analytic functions in spin, these towers of higher spin uh, operators <clears throat> 
actually have one operator at every value of L. So in other words, in the analysis we did before, maybe there was an operator every three values of L, and they just had three times the OP coefficient. Here, this tells us that there's actually only one operator uh, at each L. And in fact, all of the operators in the theory can be grouped into, all the operators in the theory with spin bigger than two can be grouped into these families or trajectories in spin. So this gives us much, much, much more information about the Hilbert space. It doesn't just say that the Hilbert space has this structure of objects moving around at long distances in ADS at very, very, very large spin, but it tells you that that continues all the way down to spin of order two. Now, <clears throat> that's very surprising. I mean, all of these ideas only seem to apply at, at very large spin. And given that this works all the way down to spin of order one, you might hope that this tells you something about uh, the locality of the theory at uh, short distances. Because I mean, these, these, these states at small l are, uh, are actually not well separated at all. And so using Using this formula, <clears throat> you can study what the very high dimension operators in the CFT, which correspond to very, very high energy states in ADS, can possibly contribute <clears throat> to these OP coefficients. <clears throat> and Simone was able to show that uh, the high energy states contribute a D disk that's, that's exponentially bounded. <clears throat> and that leads to a statement about the OP coefficients <clears throat> of some number over So the contribution of very, very high energy states with dimensions in the CFT uh, bigger than some delta gap can only contribute to these OP coefficients at a very, very suppressed level. Now what this should remind you of is that in a Lagrangian, I have interactions like, say, d phi to the fourth, but there's, they have to be suppressed by some very, very big scale. Like in a four-dimensional Lagrangian, this would be suppressed by some big scale lambda to the fourth uh, if the theory is going to make sense. <clears throat> So from the point of view of just Lagrangians and ADS, if we're going to have some effective theory that's local and makes sense up to very, very high energy scales of order lambda, then we need contributions of high dimension operators to be suppressed by powers of lambda in accord with power counting for the dimensions of these operators. So Simone's formula, in a very rigorous way, goes a long way toward showing that there has to be, if, if we assume that we have some Fox space of states that we're studying, we're studying OP coefficients up to some delta gap, then <clears throat> the contributions of high energies have to be suppressed in this way such that uh, the ADS Lagrangian is actually local up to those large scales. So surprisingly, this large spin analysis actually had a much nicer uh, uh, recent development that means that it's analytic and gives you control not just sort of at large spin, but also gives you control about short distance locality in ADS, locality at distances smaller than the ADS scale. So. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> yeah. Does Simone's picture work in T equals 2? Uh, 
I think his picture does work in D equals two, but only for, for global conformal blocks, not uh, virasoro blocks. So, uh, so these are SL2 blocks. So in fact, he checks in an appendix that if you take like the icing model and apply his formula, then you can extract the uh, OP coefficients of various virasoro descendants, which are global primaries. 